When you think of religion in India, what religion do you tend to think of? Hinduism? Maybe Islam? That would make sense, as those are the two most popular religions there. Maybe you think about Buddhism, because it was founded there. But I think it's safe to say that people seldom think about Christianity when they think of India. And while only a mere 2.3% population identifies as Christian, according to the 2011 census, the Christian communities there are incredibly unique and intriguing in their own right. Let's talk about an early Christian group that went unrecognized by Western Christians for over a thousand years in this episode of Religion IRL. These people are called St. Thomas Christians, or Nazrani, which stems from the word Nazarenes. This religion is most prominent in southwestern India in the state Kerala with a demographic Christian population of over 6 million, way higher than any other part of India. There's also a number in southeastern India in the state Chennai, but we'll get into that a little later. While many at first glance might assume that these churches were started by European evangelists, in reality, this ethno-religious community is believed by many to predate Christianity in Europe by about 200 years and is believed to be one of the earliest Christian groups. Let's talk about these St. Thomas Christians, their history, their traditions, and their sacred space. Before I talk about the history and stories of St. Thomas Christians, I should say that historians aren't sure how much of the story is legend or history or how much is shared with neighboring religions, but to St. Thomas Christians, this is their myth, this is their story, and this is their truth. Much of it can be found in the Acts of Thomas, a 3rd century apocryphal text, but much of it is simply shared through oral tradition. So I'll be sharing kind of a mix of all that. Let's start at the beginning of their story with the group's namesake, the disciple Thomas. In the Gospel, the title Thomas Didymus is attributed to a specific disciple whose real name is likely Judas. Since both of the terms Thomas and Didymus mean twin, the St. Thomas Christians believe that their patriarch was the twin of Jesus. They believe that he was also from Galilee, he was also a carpenter, and many church historians believe that Thomas was important to the early church in some way, as he has several apocryphal texts attributed to him, and he makes a large impression in the Gospel of John. Now, in the Gospel of John, Thomas was not with the other disciples during the initial resurrection and appearance of Jesus. Thomas says that unless he feels the holes in Jesus' hands and the spear mark in his side, he will not believe. Now, a week later, Jesus shows up and says, here, have a feel. After that, Thomas makes the first explicit claim of Jesus' divinity, saying, my Lord and my God. Now, after that, the disciples cast lots to decide where they are to evangelize and spread the word of God. Thomas gets India and at first refuses to go, even after Jesus confronts him about it. But when Jesus appears in human form, he sells Thomas as a slave to a merchant heading to India. Since Thomas is skilled as a carpenter, he was seen as a very important laborer. Thomas feels confused and betrayed until the merchant asks if Jesus is his master, to which he says yes, and only then he accepts his mission to go to India. Thomas traveled through the Red Sea, into the Mediterranean, and into the Arabian Sea to go to Kerala. Now, he could have possibly also gone through Afghanistan, but it's not a big deal. Accounts differ. But wherever he went, he shared the good news of Jesus wherever he would go and with whoever would listen. And once he arrived in Kerala, he began speaking about Jesus and evangelizing, gathering disciples and starting the first Indian churches in Kerala and the surrounding regions. He also performed many miracles, like defeating a giant serpent, calming a large group of wild donkeys, and exercising the devil out of a woman. He clearly began to gain some attention, even with the king of the area, King Godofaris, who would sometimes listen to his messages and was absolutely bewildered. It was said that the king and his brother would often have conversations with Thomas about God and the universe and simply belief. The king actually asked Thomas to build his new palace, but Thomas took this grant and donated it to the poor. A few years later, he traveled for a second mission toward an area of India that would later be known as Chennai, but then was called Mylapore. He arrived in an area called Little Mount. 
he would walk to a beach where he would preach the word of God and meet different people. The king of this area, King Mahadeva, would also come and watch Thomas's talks. But Thomas was later martyred. When he was praying one day, some people from town came holding spears. And as Thomas fled, he was struck with four spears. Now those four spears reflected on how his death was parallel to Jesus's. And once again, he said the phrase, my Lord and my God. Those were his last words. After this, the area that he died would later be called St. Thomas Mount. And his body would be brought back to the beach that he would often preach at. And he was buried there. Now, although this is the end of St. Thomas's story, it is far from the end of the story of the St. Thomas Christians. Slowly, over the next couple hundred years, Persian Christians, small groups, would come to Kerala escaping persecution. This likely happened around the 7th or 8th century. These groups would influence the traditions and the religion in many ways, which we'll talk about later. Also, likely, many Jews along the Malabar coast and along those areas were converted to Christianity, whether it was by Thomas or by the church that he had established. Now, I wish I could get into this group more uh, and this unique sect of Judaism, since they're really interesting in their own right, but we don't have time. Let me know, though, if you want me to make a follow-up video about that religious community. And other than the events that happened right after Jesus' death and in the 7th and 8th century with the Persian influence, for the next 1,400 years, we really don't know too much. We know that these churches continued in the western region Kerala and the eastern region Chennai, that they were included in the Indian caste system, and that they developed their own traditions and beliefs, and they mixed their teachings of Thomas with the culture in India at the time. But next, in the 1500s, the Portuguese came to Chennai in order to trade for spices and other goods. They were amazed and confused that this Indian population knew about Jesus and the Apostle Thomas. The community had told the Portuguese about his martyrdom and led them to the beach where his remains were. There, the Portuguese built a small Portuguese-style church over the tomb. They also brought over missionaries to begin to change some of the beliefs of this Indian group because they realized very quickly that they weren't Catholic and that their version of Christianity stemmed off in a very different way. They didn't exactly like the Persian and Hindu influences of the religion, such as the inclusion of the caste system. They decided to burn all the manuscripts of these St. Thomas Christians and teach them about Catholic rituals. There were many, of course, who rebelled and continued with their original traditions, but there were still many who were converted to this Latin style of Christianity, losing much of their unique cultural influences. They also took St. Thomas's remains to Europe, where it was taken to three separate locations, ending up in Ortona, Italy. In all the places where St. Thomas's grave was, Thomas is still revered and celebrated today, but no more than in India. Now, in the 1600s, the British arrived at Chennai and took over the coastline. Now, they redid the Portuguese-style church in a neuro-Gothic style, similar to a British one. And today, that church remains and is called the St. Thomas Basilica. And from there, that's more or less where our story ends. There are St. Thomas Christians in India today who practice a Catholic-inspired faith, and there are many that practice the faith of their ancestors. They've developed many different schisms, denominations, and they're all influenced in different ways with the Portuguese, the Persians, the English, and the surrounding Hindus. The Catholics now see this group to be a valid form of Christianity, not heretics, and the Pope even made St. Thomas the patron saint of India in 1606. Now, I want to emphasize that the events of St. Thomas and their early church were said to have taken place between the years 52 and 76 AD. That means that India was said to have been one of the first places where Christianity took root. Over 250 years before Armenia declared Christianity a state religion, which was the first country to do so in Europe. But these Indians were thousands of miles away from any Catholic or Orthodox Christians and without their influence for over a thousand years. Because of this, they've developed traditions and rituals that are very different from what many Christians would even recognize. Let's talk about some of these. 
First of all, the Persian Christian influence on the St. Thomas Christians was extremely significant. They introduced many Persian practices into their Christianity, but most importantly, the language Syriac, which is a liturgical language like Latin used in worship services. Now, while many church documents like manuscripts were written down in local languages like Malayalam, even today, a majority of their liturgy is still in Syriac. Next, like in Hinduism, Hindu scribes were used to account much of their literary work, both ancient and modern. Of this group, many Hindu and Muslim artists created the hymns of the St. Thomas Church and much of the artwork that they still have today. And many worship elements are unique for these people. They have special candles for anointing and lighting special occasions called the Nilavalaku. Now, special bodies of water for baptism, such as the beach right where St. Thomas is buried, and, and most importantly, the Nazrani, or the St. Thomas Cross. Now, it's not your run-of-the-mill cross with a lowercase t-shape, but rather, it has the sides of equal lengths, and they are adorned with flowery edges, representing the joyfulness of the resurrection, and a lotus, which is a symbol borrowed from Buddhism, recognizing that Christ's word came to the land of Buddha. Finally, many of the portrayals that they have of Jesus look more like what we might picture a Hindu or Buddhist statue to look like, rather than a Western Christian one. Like this one. Notice the long hair and the long droopy ears. Many Portuguese colonists were disgusted by this portrayal of Jesus, which is why, for the most part, they were all destroyed. They must have been more used to the accurate representation of the European Christ. Now, in terms of sacred space, we've already touched on a couple of spots that are extremely important for the St. Thomas Christians. The St. Thomas Basilica obviously is the most important of these. It is incredibly unique, as it is one of only three churches that were believed to be built on the remains of one of Jesus' apostles. The other two apostles are St. James in Spain and St. Peter in the Vatican. Since the church in India has gone through several remodels, it's not the physical building of the church itself that's sacred, but rather the land that it's on. The beach and the water. It's considered incredibly holy by the St. Thomas Christians. And in addition to this, the other churches that St. Thomas established are considered holy sites. Note these along the coast. In conclusion, the Christians of St. Thomas exemplify how cultures can intertwine in a beautiful way. The St. Thomas Christians are the result of religions not only being tolerant of one another, not simply coexisting, but truly respecting and sharing with one another. There are church documents that show this respect for the Hindu culture and the Hindu culture's respect for the St. Thomas Christians. One of these is a manuscript with a bishop of this church advising this group to celebrate the king's birthday. And another example of how the Hindus had respect for them is by including them in the caste system. And not too far low, either. Some Hindus even consider St. Thomas to be a minor family deity. After Thomas healed a number of family members and gave them four silver coins, those silver coins became sacred, and the family continued to pay homage to the miracle worker. In all these ways, this community blended in with the Hindus and became an integral part of Kerala. India is an incredibly interesting place when it comes to religion. And many Christians don't know that there's a unique early Christian community amongst all of the Buddhist history and Hindu legends, all of which surround the disciple who we have deemed Doubting Thomas. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video, both Dr. Wansink, who this video is for, and anyone else who happens to watch. And be sure to check out my description for all my citations. I took a lot into account because I am by no means any expert when it comes to Christianity in India. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks for watching.